And so I jumped in there. At the time, I was a purple belt in jiu-jitsu and obviously a black belt in karate and uh, kimpo. And uh, we fought. It lasted about a minute and a half, and I broke his arm. What? Yeah. Sometimes what seems like the end is really the beginning. I'm going to take you behind the curtain of my life, and my friends are going to tell their stories, too. I thought my life was over when I got molested as a child. Then I got pregnant at 17, and my drug addict ex-husband held a gun to my head but only God could give me the life that I have today. And you can have that too. We're going from the pain to the promise in a real, raw, and organic way. Are you ready? Let's go. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Nothing ever gonna keep me. Hey, I'm glad you're here in the fighting ring of all places where I'm singing that old song from the 90s. I think it was from Shrek, right? I don't think they were talking about winning in the fighting ring. But man, if that isn't the attitude of a champion, I don't know what it is. And today, oh y'all, I got a champion coming on here with me. It is Frank Mir. We're talking about how to make a comeback. I mean, th this guy, UFC two-time heavyweight champion. I tell you what, he knows. He knows everything about making a comeback. Because people hear two-time champion, two-time heavyweight champion, and they think all victory. They don't think about the getting knocked down. Most people don't know about the motorcycle accident. They don't know that he wasn't supposed to walk again. They don't know about the depression. They don't know about getting addicted to pain medications. They don't know about your future. Everything you thought was gonna be, everything you thought you were gonna live for is gone. To quote the great Rocky Balboa, every champion was once a contender who refused to give up. If you're watching this today and life has knocked you down, be encouraged. It's time for you to make your comeback. Let's see, intellectual, uh, thoughtful, overthinker. I love going to Disneyland with my kids. You know what I mean? Something my wife and I had done at a very young age with them, and so it just, it's very nostalgic for me. It just reminds me when my children were their youngest, and I'm pushing a stroller with one over my shoulder back and trying to carry them in at the end of the night because they've passed out, and we're going late night back to the hotel room. My wife makes this uh, this pork with sauerkraut potatoes, and, and it's very much one of her, on her mother's side, they're from Austria, and so it's a, it's a, it's a popular dish. Yeah. Can you give you phrases of it for us? Oh, no. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my favorite song is uh, uh, Johnny Cash, Ain't No Grave. Just uh, every time it's funny, like, I get emotional, I get teary eyed, and get choked up every time I listen to it. Everybody, Frank Mir. And if I do not behave myself, he's going to put me in a chokehold and put me to sleep. <laughs> How old were you when you became champion? Um, at the time, I was 24. And yeah, a month into my 24th year, I became the youngest heavyweight champion at the time for the UFC. When did you start fighting, like professionally mm -hmm. fighting? <laughs> well, I've always done martial arts. My father came over from Cuba and uh, was big into boxing and wrestling and, and judo was big there. And he opened up a karate school. And so I was that, you know, at four years old, I had my first official lesson. But I mean, there's photos of me in a carrier while he's beating on the bag and, and had to, you know, that I was getting babysitted at the gym at that time. So, <laughs> so when did you get involved with the UFC? Uh, well, it was, I was 21. The vice president of the UFC actually wrote his 10 speak up to the gym, 10 speed up to the gym we were at. And he had asked me if I was ever interested in fighting. At the time, I hadn't had no fights yet. And I was like, yeah, I'm actually, I am, but I just haven't gotten to that yet. You know, I'm still working and doing things. And so uh, an opportunity came up where I fought two f small fights as a professional. It did well. I won them. And uh, the time I'm living with my uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach, uh, Ricardo Perez, and uh, he, uh, he comes and knocks on my door and goes, hey, I just got a call from the UFC. Uh, they said it's short notice, you know, but uh, one of the guys fell out. He's injured. And, and they need an opponent for Roberto Traven. And mm. Roberto Traven at the time was a four-time uh, world champion in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, wait, 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 wait. So your first fight is against a guy who's been a champion four times? Yeah, yeah, and he's undefeated <laughs> in MMA. And basically they told me, they're like, in a nice way, they're like, we'll give you a three-fight deal. Meaning that we know you're not going to win this first one. <laughs> you got about 20 days to get ready for it. This other guy's been getting ready for the last you know, two months. 
Um, but you know, if you're willing to jump in there, you're gonna be rewarded for that with an opportunity to be in the UFC. And so I jumped in there. At the time, I was a purple belt in jiu-jitsu and then obviously a black belt in karate and uh, kimpo. And uh, we fought, it lasted about a minute and a half and I broke his arm. What? Uh, <laughs> so I was introduced to the UFC. I still hold the record for the most submissions as far as any heavyweight in the UFC. Wow, yeah. so that, that's when you, somebody goes enough, enough, and they, what's right. a submission, they tap out? They tap out, or some of my submissions, the people weren't able to tap <laughs> because, because they lost consciousness, or yeah. they tapped too late, and so the referee actually stopped it. So <laughs> if they're in a submission and the referee gets involved, it still counts as a submission for So you. yes. you're champion, it's 2004, something bigger than becoming champion kind of gets in the way, what happens? So it's uh, after I won my title, I wanted a motorcycle. So I went out there and bought myself a Suzuki Jixer 1000. My brother came and picked me up. It was my last night of work because I still kept a full-time job up until 2009. Wow. Um, and worked, still fought professionally and was a champion twice. Um, and so uh, he's picking me up. We're bouncers at the Rhino. And so uh, he comes on his bike and we're going to jump on and we're driving. I had actually signaled him that my, my uh, fuel light had came on. So I switched my pump over, you know, from my, to my reserve. And I actually had my forearm on my gas tank and as I'm, I'm driving with, and, and we're going about 35 miles an hour and he's over behind me somewhere and as we go through the light turns yellow and a guy had been waiting and he decides now to go really quick, take a left hand turn in front of us. Well, he made a mistake. So as he goes, I initially reacted. So I grabbed, I jumped on the brakes, but because I broke, so I hit the brakes so hard, I came up on my front wheel. So then I let off the, uh, the brake, my rear tire re-engages with the ground, so I gas it, and as I'm trying to accelerate now out of this situation, for some reason he decided to accelerate out of the situation. So he starts to gun it as I started to gun it. Now I'm committed to my mistake. He's committed to his mistake. He's pushing down on the throttle. And he crashes on the side of me, he hits me, throws me about 90 feet through the air, breaks my femur in half, did some damage to the hips and knees. And uh, when I land, I hit the ground, I remember just feeling like I was uh, underwater, like, you know, riptide, just being dragged. So I'm getting dragged, and then I get a really hard hit, and that was the actual sidewalk. I hit it with the back of my head and put cement into my uh, helmet, and it skipped me onto the grass. And then when I finally landed, I stopped, uh, I puked. You know, that was the first thing that happened. I just, my body just vomited. So now I'm trying to get my, my uh, helmet off, which the only reason why I was even tied up is for whatever reason, my wife had walked me out that night and as I went to leave, she stopped me to tie my helmet. Mm. I never would tie my helmet. And so uh, probably saved my life because if I'd have lost my helmet in the air, I hit yeah. the sidewalk hard in the back of my head. And so the paramedics finally get there and they say, hey man, what's up? And I had, because I had won the title about uh, six weeks, eight weeks before, the guy recognized me, he's looking at me, he's all, hey man, was one leg longer than the other? I was like, no, that's new. <laughs> and so then they all got serious. They checked my blood pressure and they're like, wow, your, your blood pressure's off the hook. Your, your heart rate's about 140 right now. Like you're probably internally bleeding. Your femur's either shattered or broken. Like, cause your leg now is the way the bone was. Like it's doing this, it's pulling your leg in. So they had to put me in traction and pull my leg back out. So I started breathing. I remember that's what I started doing. I was like, okay, I can't die like this. I'm only, you know, I'm like, this isn't the way I'm gonna go. All right. Let me slow my heart rate down. If I'm bleeding to death, let me just try to just relax because obviously my heart's firing too hard. And so I, I got my heart rate, my breathing under control. And then, uh, then when we get to the hospital, they, they, I found out about the, uh, the broken leg. They made it official and just told me, hey, surgery, and we're gonna put a pin through it and just fix the rest of you up. And that was the uh, start of a, <laughs> of a long chloral back. What did they say you'd never do again? Oh, fighting was off the table. Have you ever felt sucker punched by life? I mean, COVID or somebody that you love left. You're trying to deal with the pressures of life, but you feel like it's bigger than you are. So I, I relate, I felt helpless. My ex-husband, he left me for drugs. I ended up divorced, a single mom that ended up bankrupt and foreclosed on. But no matter what life throws at you, God is bigger and he has a plan to take you out of survival mode and get you thriving again. That's why I wrote this book, to help you get up one more time, to stand on his promise in 20 seconds of insane courage and move forward in your life. I want this for you so much that I developed a package valued at over $300 to help you find healing and happiness. When you go to nicolecrank.com forward slash thrive right now, you'll get the I Will Thrive Hardback book an 11 video I Will Thrive book club series teaching and eight of my very best teachings that will help you begin to thrive again. All of this for just $19.99. Here's what people are saying about how the book has helped them. I started reading your book at eight o'clock this morning and I finished it at three. <laughs> you read the whole thing straight through. 
It was awesome. It's an awesome book. And I think when I finish mine, I'm going to have to pass it on to somebody else. I want it back, but I've got so many people that I want to read it. Right now, go to NicoleCrank.com forward slash thrive to receive this special limited time offer. I want you to have this amazingly discounted book and video bundle. You're not meant to survive. You're meant to thrive. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I mean, that's how you fight, right? And the purpose for the yellow suit. You know, everybody's got a big dream, but you gotta be ready to fight for it. My good friend Joseph, he had to do the same thing. In Genesis 37, there's this kid named Joseph, and he has this amazing, wild, big dream. And even more than that, he feels like this dream is from the Lord. And then everything happened. I mean, legitimately everything. His brothers hated him. They wanted to kill him. He was sold into slavery. He gets into a house where he gets promoted up and then he gets accused of rape. He doesn't even do it. So he gets thrown in prison for 13 years. 13 years in prison, he gets forgotten about and then he finally gets another shot. I mean, nothing's more exciting than being turned upside down for the count and coming back and winning the game in the last few seconds. You know, Cardinals, right? St. Louis. Here we go. Nothing's more exciting than we're in the bottom of the ninth. Looks like we're losing, but the rally towels come out. And you know what? I think that's what's happening with you right now. The rally towels are out. I mean, especially like if it's a playoff game or Super Bowl or, you know, it, it's the game seven of the World Series. Or maybe if a UFC title's riding on it. If it's your business, if it's your family, if it's your marriage. You know, Romans 8, 38 in the Living Bible says, where I am convinced, and I just wonder how convinced you are today. It says, for I am convinced that no thing, nothing, no matter how big, how small, how crazy, how often, how ominous, it says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Death, it can't. Life, it can't. Angels, won't and all the powers of hell itself. And I know it feels like you're going through hell. And if you're going through hell, don't stop because not even the power of hell can keep God's love away from you. You can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a woman of God down. Not when God is on our side. I mean, God might cause you to miss some steps and we might even have some miss steps in the whole deal. But you know what? God has this ability to kind of fast forward to breathe some life into you, to rewind, let you do some things over again. And right now, I think he's just pressing play so this thing can play out. You know, it might not be normal what's going on with you, and I get that. Unusual success, it means that you're not normal. Unusual blessing, it means that you're not normal. You don't wanna be normal. You want the unusual, so you just have to believe in the unusual. You have to live for the unusual and you can't be shocked by the unusual. You, my friend, you're gonna give birth to your own breakthrough, but to give birth to a breakthrough, you have to get broken to get a breakthrough. That's what the setback was about. What does that mean? Well, John 12, verse 24, it says, most assuredly, I say to you, that's right, to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and it dies. That's a harsh word. It remains alone. But if it dies, if it allows itself to be broken, if it can go into the ground and it looks like it's dark and you can't see anything and it's dirty and it feels like as you compact the dirt on top of the seed that everything is pushing down on you. There's pressure and darkness. Am I describing your life right now? If that seed goes down in there and it dies, it grows roots and it produces much harvest. My friend, I know it looks like the waves are coming and I know it looks like you're in above your head and you might even be gurgling right now, but don't drown in something that you should be walking on. As we get ready to wrap up in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, it says, therefore my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the faith. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. Every single setback has a comeback. God saw this coming from long ago. And he put in plan a place and a way of escape from before the circumstance even happened. If there hadn't been a setback with Adam and Eve, there would have been no Jesus comeback. Y'all, 
There would have been no Christmas story. There would have been no Easter. I mean, even Paul, Paul wrote two thirds of the New Testament. And in Corinthians 11, he lists all of his setbacks. He's like, I've been abundant in prison. I've been whipped with stripes by the Jews alone. I have 40 stripes, save one. I was beaten with rods. I was stoned three times. I've been shipwrecked and left for dead in the deep day and night. I've been at the peril of robbers and countrymen, the church and the brethren. The boy had been through it all. Oh. You know why I tell you that? Because it's not just you. Even Frank. Frank Mayer, on top of the world. I'm on top of the world, stripped of everything. He could have stayed down. Jesus could have stayed down. Joseph could have stayed down. Paul could have stayed down. But in James 1, we see Paul says, I count it all joy. He said, count it all joy when I fall into diverse temptations. I know it's hard to look around and smile at this thing, but maybe you can look around and smile at it knowing whew, there's no bigger clue than God is at work. God's at work, my friend. This thing mm -mm, was meant to be your tombstone, but it's gonna be your stepping stone to the future that God has for you. Now get to work. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. It was probably about three months later. I remember sitting in the office or inside the examining room and he's talking about how my leg is not stable and why it's not stable and what they could possibly do. I was like, okay, so this is not, will I be able to hold a stance? And the guy looked at me and goes, what? I'm like, well, a stance. I need to put weight here and pivot this way. He goes, I'm trying to get you to walk to the parking lot without, you know, buckling every time. And, and you know, because, you know, he goes, you think you're still going to fight? And I remember it was one of those things where we're like, oh, that's not, that's not, we're not on the same wavelength, huh? So then I was like, yeah, no, this is talking about way of life. I think you need to kind of let that go. You know, he was being polite about it, you know? So I remember that's when I, I went home and I drove to the house and I was parked outside my wife, explained her the situation. Obviously there's a little more tears and choked up. And so she's just, just wait there. So I just sat in the car and I couldn't go inside the house. I couldn't look at my kids. And that was, uh, you know, another step on the way of just being told by everybody that the comeback can't happen, that, that this is over with. What I've taken from that moment is that if you have information that can help me, I'll listen to you. Mm -hmm. If you just want to tell me your opinion, I got no time for that. So when you got that news, how did it make you feel? Oh, it crushed me. It took away my identity and who I am. And still, even to this day, it's funny. It probably has helped me now because as I've even gotten into my 40s now, I've had to revisit and look at things as far as who I am and, and uh, you know, not be able to compete or not fight. That was very detrimental to my psyche. It was crushing. How were you dealing with the physical pain? Um, well, at the time, they were very, very uh, 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 liberal with the prescription of, uh, of opioids. And so, uh, you know, they put the rod through my leg, and I'm literally sitting there. They gave me a bottle of 180 uh, uh, Percocets, or Lord tell where it was at the time, the tens. And I'm crushing up two or three at a time. And in two weeks, I'd gone through, or, you know, 10 days, I'd gone through 180 of them. Wow. She calls up the doctor, and they call in another 180. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. Wow. And so no one was warning us and telling us, like, hey, this could end up, you know, these things are addictive. You know what I mean? Like, and so, uh, and so yeah, I battled for years. And still, it's still a demon that I have to make sure that I can't underestimate. So they tell you you're going to walk with a limp. Mm -hmm. Then you get addicted to pain medication. Heavily. So things went from the accident to the diagnosis. Oh yeah, no, the hole's getting deeper and deeper and I'm crawling down it and then, uh, you know, without getting too personal, there was some very bad moments that I think my wife realized the only thing that was gonna save my life was to put me back into a fight. And that was very much, she was right. Mm. The minute they booked, things just started like clicking in me. I was like a dog that's been pulling a sled and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you pulled the rope out. And I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to pull, right? Yeah. And so even though I was still mentally and physically broken, um, I started going back to the gym and it was just, Poor workouts and awful. It was just a poor performance. Mm. And even the fight, you know, like I didn't do well. I lost. Uh, I, I think I was I lost that fight. Bounced back. Won a fight in the middle that was ugly. Lost again. And then uh, here it's like three, you know, two years after the accident. And Joe, I have a fight scheduled. It's the fourth fight now since the accident. You know, and uh, he just broke it down like how it's supposed to be. Like, hey man. This isn't about you winning the fight anymore. Obviously, the accident took too much out of you. You don't have it anymore. 
Um, you either go out there and win like the old Frank Mir, a win isn't gonna save your career right now. Mm. You win this fight, we don't care. If you don't go out there and basically take someone's head off, you're done. So here I'm trying to fight and battle back and have you know good days and bad days and you know and uh, you know that's the thing. It wasn't like I wish I could sit there and say there was one moment where the Rocky music came on and nothing ever was a problem since then. No, I'd have a good Monday and an awful Tuesday and okay Wednesday and Thursday you couldn't find me. Friday I tried again. You know what I mean? There was all these ups and downs that constantly through and that was probably the one moment where actually I felt like me again because then I, I went into the fight knowing that was what the circumstances were. And uh, I went out there and submitted the guy in under a minute, you know, and it was the old me again. Like, I looked normal, you know? Once she won that fight, what happened? I think I saw success again. Yeah. I, thought, I think that really in the back of my mind, at that point, I had a conversation with my wife. It was, probably, it was one of the more brutal ones I've ever had with her. I'd call that my manhood. She, uh, questioned who I was as a person, made me question who I was as a person. You know, like, is this really what's going to take to destroy you? That's the father of these children that you've created? Like, this is the man that they're supposed to look up to, that this is the, the hero that they have? You know, like, this is ridiculous and pathetic, you know? And so uh, I, I crawled around and I like, wow, like, that was that was rough, you know? But it was actually uh, something I needed to hear. You know, I was it was a pity party. That made me change. That was actually probably the one speech in my life that really just constantly like lit me up and turned me around. Did you fight again after that? I did. I went off and we fought. Uh, that was the Anthony Hardunk fight. I fought Brock Lesnar, who again was a big monster. I submitted him. Worked my way up to fight for the title for the uh, for the next time that I had won it. I fought who at the time everybody considered one of the number one fighters in the world. He came over from Pride as a Pride champion. I think he was number two in the world at the time. And uh, again, you know, underestimated, but just happy that I was there, that the show was pretty much everybody treated me. I went out there and destroyed him. I completely just, uh, I knocked him down about four different times in two rounds, and they finally stopped the fight because uh, it was, he didn't know where he was. I just, and uh, that was my full circle of coming back from a very, very deep hole. You, you became champion again. Champion. That's why actually, I, well, a few times I've ever, <laughs> I, have, I make fun of other people sometimes when I do it, but I, I started crying after I won the title because of such a long journey. I mean, four years it took for me to come back from mm -hmm. what I, that had happened. You wouldn't be here if you weren't great. You wouldn't be here if you weren't qualified. So you gotta tap into your why. Now is the time to choose who you really are and who will you become. Will you let the adversity take the win from you? It's not possible. Get up! What are you doing down there? Don't you know that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus? Get up! You need some water, drink it, but get up! Let's go, let's go, let's go, you're a winner! Don't think about it, be it. Victory, now, mountaintop season. Let's go, clap it up. Take a look at your life right now. Do you like where you're going? Are the people in your life helping you get to where you want to be? Have you ever heard two people talking at a lunch table and wished you could pull up a chair and just learn? This is your opportunity. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Studies have shown that you are the sum of the people that you hang out with. I mean, we all need people in our lives coaching us, teaching us, mentoring us, cheering us on, and making us into better people. And that is why I created the Circle of Friends. It's a chance for us to connect and increase the level that we live on. Here's what you get when you go to NicoleCrank.com forward slash circle and become a partner. Every month we'll have live coaching sessions, workshops with Zoom calls between us where you get to ask questions, engage, learn, or I'll bring on a guest influencer like Joel Osteen, Christine Kane, Mike Todd, Sarah Jakes Roberts. They'll share some of the most valuable lessons they've learned, just like you were sitting at that table. We've got a best of Nicole library with a bunch of teachings. And best of all, you're not just a friend, you're a partner baked in daily prayer, getting weekly emails. And your monthly contribution is a seed that helps us be on TV and provide books to prisons, recovery homes, and people who need them. If you're ready to get in a group of friends who will help you be all that God made you to be, and be a difference to others at the same time, this is it. For less than the cost of buying bubblegum, you can change the course of your life. Just go to NicoleCrank.com forward slash circle and become a member today. Trust me, you'll be so glad you did. Frank and I are gonna pray for you in just a minute. But before we do, I just wanted to share something with you. 
the mindset of a champion, it's just different. That's why they get different results. And you might be thinking, but I am not a champion. No, but God is. You might be thinking, but I've been knocked down. Yeah, but God's in your corner. You might be thinking, I can't do this by myself. Newsflash, you were never created to do. So here you are, you're sitting in the corner, your head's down, and I'm coming into the corner, right? Me and God, me and the Holy Spirit, we're here and we're saying, hey, are you ready to make a comeback physically? Yeah, you are. Come on, are you ready to make a comeback mentally? That's right, that's what I'm talking about. You ready to make a financial comeback, an emotional comeback? Come on, I'm in your corner. The Holy Spirit's in your corner. God is cheering you on. You can do this. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. I just had some guy from Australia message me. Australia is like as far from my house as you can get. You know what I'm talking about? I don't even know. We don't even hardly speak the same language. But he went to NicoleCrank.com forward slash let's talk, sent me a message and said he just found the program a few days ago and he'd already joined the circle of friends. What's that you say? It's my high value partnership program. It's where you partner with us on the program every single month and you, you get a Zoom call every single month, sometimes two of them, where I personally coach you. And then I bring my friends, Joel Osteen, Mike Todd, Taylor Madu, Sarah Jakes Roberts, all these people that come around and we personally coach you, we get in your corner. My friend from Australia said, this ministry has really made me feel as though I belong. You know, it's hard to feel like you don't belong somewhere. And that's what you do. And I wanna say thank you. I wanna say thank you for supporting this program and helping us reach people on the other side of the world. The show's on on five continents and thank you for that. We're reaching the marginalized, the hurt, the depressed, the broken, the broken down, and the people who are on the floor that need to come back. And if you wanna help us reach those folks, if this show gave you hope and encouragement today, I wanna ask you, what'd you give today? By going to NicoleCrank.com forward slash donate. Or if you're a texter, you got your phone in your hand, you can just text Nicole Crank to the number right below. Every dollar you give helps us reach more people. I wanna pray for you now. Your comeback's on the way. Father God, you see a champion on the inside of them. You're calling out to their heart and you're saying, champion, come forth. You see them winning. You see them in victory. You see them ruling. You see them reigning. God, I ask you, to speak to their heart, their recreated human spirit, and give them what they don't have on their own. The Bible says when we are weak, that's when you're strong. Fill in the gaps and take them to that place that you called them to from the beginning of time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Boom, 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 bang, bang, bang. This is gonna be cake. You know how this guy can talk. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna take a nap in the middle because he's gonna carry it. <laughs> as long as you're gonna be like, short. I get that a lot. No, <laughs> no, no. The, the talk. Don't be short here. Just say the things. <laughs> All right, here we go. Mm-hmm.